before we begin, let me draw your attention to something that might be useful to you. Uh, up on YouTube, we've got to talk about cat videos now, or Super Bowl commercials. I suppose you've seen them all by now, right? No? Go up to YouTube and you search OML DMI. And you'll see a stunning array of videos. The majority of them are from 105. You notice they go taping our 106 lectures. So if you need to go back with you and miss the class, that's an opportunity. And what I've done, there are four of these now for chapter seven. For each of the, the uh, worksheets I give you, there's a screencast where I talk you through the solution to it, about eight, nine minutes long. So they're good to help you prepare for our exam next Friday. We're going to uh, go into the third kind of confidence interval today, the fourth type on Monday, wrap things up on Wednesday, and exam next Friday. Right? So make use of those and uh, make my views go up. Right? Mm -hmm. Go viral. Okay, slideshow. I'm going to uh, quickly go over one more example of a confidence interval for a mean when we don't know sigma. Keep in mind the distinction. We've done two kinds of confidence intervals so far, both involve a mean. One sigma known, sigma unknown. I, I added this slide recently. And the other day, if you have a TI-84, I showed you the T critical values. If you don't have a TI-84, you don't have the inverse T function, you have to use table A3. And this is how you do it. You find your degrees of freedom, and that is the first column and that gives you the row in the table. Now just a quick refresher here. What is the degrees of freedom for T distribution of sample size N? N minus one. Thank you. N minus one. So it's an easy calculation. N minus one, the degrees of freedom. So I know I'm on this row. Now it's a matter of finding the correct column. Area in one tail or area in two tails? Well, if it's a 95% confidence level, I've got 0.95 area in the middle, 0.05 in both tails. And if I have 0.05 in both tails, I have 0.025 in each tail. So there's my column. That's my T critical value. So uh, again, for the test next Friday, you'll need to be able to calculate these. If you don't have an 84, make sure you bring your form machine. So where did you say we, uh, where is the formula sheet on Angel? Okay. Yeah. All right, let's calculate one more confidence interval for me pretty quickly. We see some data values. And then I'm going to go and talk about a confidence interval for proportions. If you have the worksheet, another example for a confidence interval for me, sigma unknown. You should have been working on that. If you get stuck on it, remember, the YouTube video takes you through it. So you got that as backup. All right. Now let's quickly do another one with just a little bit of a twist. In the front row here. Oh. I don't know if that's going to let me. I guess I can. All right. That's right. I could do that, couldn't I? Current slide. All right, give me your heights and inches. What I'm going to have you do is put these in. We're just going to have five data points. Put these into L1, and we're going to create a 95% confidence interval for the height of a cadet based on our first row here. All right? Zillow, your height? 
67. Thank you. 67. 70. 70. Um, 71. 71. How tall are you? Me? Yeah, what's your height in inches? Uh, my five. So it'd be uh, 65. 65. 68. All right, you've got those in L1, I hope. And we're going to use one of our stats to get our S value. Sometimes you're given the sample statistics, sometimes you're given the raw data values, and you have to calculate the sample statistics. So let's back up here. I always ask you to start with what's the parameter? Or the parameter is a mu. In this case, it's the mean height of a cadet. So let's calculate a 95% confidence level. I have uh, five data points. Question? No? All right, now what else do I need to know to calculate a confidence interval for me? Stop up? Uh, you need to know uh, Z over no. alpha over 2. Right. All right, so alpha is going to be 0 0.05, and alpha over 2 is 0 0.025. Got that? What else do I need to know? I need a standard deviation, either the sample or the population. In this problem, which will I have? I'll have a sample standard deviation. Be alert to this on your homework problems and on the test Friday. You need to be able to discern whether I'm working with a sigma or an S. And here I'm clearly working with an S. I've got five data points, so I need an S one bar stats, and you read down on the calculator, it says S sub X. What did you get? 2.387. 2.387. So that's our S. The only twist in this example is I gave you data values instead of just giving you an S and you had to calculate it. All right? We need an E, a margin of error, and that's T alpha over 2, S over the square root of N. And I've got everything there except the T alpha over 2, don't I? Let's think about what that looks like. I've got 95% confidence in the level, so it's 0.95 there. 0.025 here, and that's my T sub 0.025. Find that value. If you're a TI 83 person, get out table A3. If you're an 84 person, inverse T. Yes? That's our Z score, right? You're just using Z as the variable? No, no, no. I'm using the T distribution because I'm working with an S. In fact, I should have done one other thing. Degrees of freedom is 4, or n minus 1. A really important point. If you decide that you're working with an S instead of sigma, the distribution's a T, not a Z. All right? So what is T sub 0.025? Who's got it for me? 2.776. 2.776. Then this would be 2.776. S, 2.387 over the square root of five. Yeah. And that would be my E. And my confidence interval would be X bar plus or minus E. Um, I'm sorry, sir. How 
what what values do we think we calculate with reverse to get that? The two values. Area to the left says 0.975. Right? Inverse functions always go to the left. Then for the t, you need the degrees of freedom. So it's going to be 4 in this case. You got a different number? I have an x over here. Yeah. How do you how do you find the reason for the word? N minus one. N minus one. N minus one. Easiest calculation you got. Okay, so what's my margin there? Y'all this? You have it? Zilla? Two point nine six three. And uh, oh, I never asked you what the x bar was from the one bar stats. What was our x bar? Six point two. Six point two. So now I would calculate my x bar plus e and my x bar minus e. That would be sixty-eight point two plus two point nine six three. Sixty-eight point two minus two point nine six three. And what are those numbers? 65.2 for the subtraction. 65? No, that's for the subtraction one. Yeah. I do that. 65.2. Mm-hmm. And then 71.2. Yeah. 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 All right. Give me a sentence then that summarizes our findings. From our sample of five cadets, what can we say? about the height of cadets. Looks that 95% of all cadets are between the height of 70, 1.2 inches and 65.2 inches. Don't say it that way. Not quite. We're not saying 95%. Oh, we're, we're saying that 95, there's a 95% chance that the mean of, all, of cadets is between 71.2 and 65.2 inches. Uh, no. You're, you're a great straight man for me. You're giving me all. Listen closely because these are very common misunderstandings, and it's a hard to understand exactly what this thing means. It does not mean that necessarily 95% of the heights are between those numbers. It doesn't mean that the probability that the true mean of a cadet is between those two numbers. It means the following: I'm 95% confident that the true mean height of cadets is between 65.2 and 71.2 inches. Does that sound like kind of weasel wording there? Like what's the big difference? There is a difference. It's important. I'm not saying it's a 0.95 probability that the true mean is between those numbers. The true mean isn't a random variable. It's either between those numbers or it isn't. What you're saying is, if I repeat this process, take sample five cadets, calculate a confidence interval, if I do that again and again and again, on average, 95% of the time, that confidence interval will contain the true mean. Somewhere in there. I don't know where, somewhere in there. You see the difference then, what you said? It's, it's different. It's, it's, it's subtle, but it's important. All right, any questions on that? Yeah. How do you get uh, X bar again? Where does that come from? One bar stats. Oh, okay. In this case, since we had data elements, data values, we had to do one bar stats. Now, I think it's time to disclose a secret to you. I'm holding back. Are you ready for this? Go to uh, stat, tests, Scroll down to number eight, it's called T interval. You gotta love me after this, All right? T interval. Now the first thing it says, input or data. In this case, select data. That means you're telling the calculator, I don't have the sample statistics, I have the raw data values. In that case, it prompts you for a list, doesn't it? So you put L1. Then it asks you for a frequency, it'll be one, always is. A C level, 
0.95. Calculate. And you get, hopefully you got the same numbers or within rounding errors what we got up here. Remember that from last year? Why did I tell you that to begin with? Huh? Yeah. You have two functions available to you, and you you may use them. There's the z interval function and the t interval function. Think about the naming; it makes sense. Z interval, z distributions. You'll use it for an interval for a mean when you know sigma. T interval. An interval using the t distribution. You would use it for an interval for a mean when you don't know sigma, you know s. So I've been taking you through the bit by bit calculations to ensure that you understand all the little pieces. And now here's a shortcut. Don't forget the little pieces though. I will expect that you still know the little pieces. But all the parts mean. Something to cheer you up today, right? And the week on a high note. Okay, now I'm going to move on to our third kind of confidence interval. It's for a different parameter. We're going to switch to a proportion of P. And it's going to be very similar, just a few things different. And I'll, I'll talk for about 10, 15 minutes, then I'll hand out a worksheet. You'll be ready to take off the training wheels and do one on your own. All right? Confidence intervals for a proportion. Examples. All those opinion polls you see all the time, or the election polls, they're all based on proportions or percentages. How many people are going to vote for Rome? Or how many people believe global warming is caused by human activity? All those kind of polls, the parameter that they're seeking is a P or a proportion. Right? The true parameter, no one knows. At least not until the election was over. We didn't know what the true value of P was, did we? And we probably never know the true value of P, how many people believe that global warming is caused by human activity. We can't poll everyone at once. We can take a sample, and we can compute some statistics and get a confidence interval for P. <coughs> now let's go back to our notation here. And make sure that we've got this distinction. We have the population. Like the sample. We're using an X bar to estimate a mu. And now my population parameter is a P, and my point statistic will be a P hat. It's my sample proportion. P hat is to P as X bar is to mu. That's my notation. Now here's, here's a little twist between what you've been doing and what we're going to do now. Underneath the covers, a proportion or percentage is really a binomial distribution. Remember those from way back, 105? Binomial, success, failure. P is the probability of success. Q is 1 minus P, probability of failure. Hopefully that sounds vaguely familiar. P hat equals X over N is just the simple formula that defines how you calculate that sample statistic. In a binomial variable, we count numbers of successes, don't we? That, in fact, that is a random variable. How many successes did we have? I flip a coin 100 times, X is the number of hits. That's the number of successes. All right? P hat equals X over N. That's how you calculate the sample statistic you're dealing with proportion. That's my point estimate, just like the x bar is a point estimate for a mean. We 
have the same framework for calculating confidence intervals for P's. I need a confidence level that's going to be 95%, 99%, 90%. I'll have an alpha, 1 minus the confidence level. I'll have a critical value. It's going to be a Z value. So now we're back to using the Z distribution again. Don't forget it. You've got to switch back and forth context. You'll be using a different distribution depending on the parameter you're studying. So now I'm back to the Z distribution, and I'll calculate a margin of error, just like I did with the mean. Same idea, anyways. And I'll calculate my confidence interval. It'll be p hat minus e, p hat plus e, just like we did before, although I had x bars. And we'll write our confidence interval as an inequality, like that one, to remind us that what we're studying is a p or a proportion. All right, I need a formula for my margin of error and for a proportion. That's the formula. It's on your formula sheet, and it's baked into a calculator function. And I'm going to be generous today. We'll go right to the calculator function. So what are the piece parts you need to know to calculate a confidence interval for proportion? Well, you need the point estimate, which is p hat. You will find that. You'll do your sample. Count the number of successes, x, and x over n is the p hat. q hat is easy, it's 1 minus p hat. You have to have a sample size and a critical value. And once you know those numbers, you're ready to calculate a confidence interval for a proportion. And yeah, just pointing out again, we're back to a z distribution. In these problems, the first thing I want you to always do is identify the parameter. What are you studying? Because the parameter determines how you go forward from there, which distribution you want to use. We're studying a proportion. Now there has, there's a set of requirements that have to be satisfied before I go any further. Don't do anything that follows this slide unless this is true. I need to have at least five successes and five failures. Let's think about what that means. N is the total number of trials, right? And P is the probability of a single success. So N times P is the number of successes. And N times Q is the number of failures. And they have to be greater than five. If both of those are true, both are true, then you can go ahead and use the technique that we're going to describe. All right, let's do a problem. We surveyed uh, 1,501 adults, and we asked them if they believe human activity causes global warming. Of those surveyed, 105,050 uh, agreed with the state. So if you wanted to report in the news tonight at CNN, CNN, Fox, or CBS, in a recent poll conducted at VMI, they found that this percent of the American public believes that global warming is caused by human activity. And then they usually say, and the margin of error is, right? And all those voting polls, didn't they say margin of error is 3%, 5%? Remember that? Okay, we're going to go through the, the calculations and when they were talking that's exactly the margin error we're calculating here so let's go through the problem break it down step by step do we do we have the requirements satisfied well easily here because the sample size is so large it's 1500 NP and NQ are much greater than five so I'm good to go with the technique. 
Brain wide, no. Once you've, <coughs> once you've identified the parameter, that's step one. You verify that the requirements are satisfied, that's step two. In the third step, I want you to read the paragraph and extract the numbers, and every number deserves a symbol, a statistical symbol. So in this case, I need a, I've got an N, 1501. That's how many people I talked to. Now the number that responded S, uh, yes is 1050. What would I sign that? Well, keep in mind, this is a binomial situation. I have successes and failures. X is the number of successes. In the context of this problem, what's a success? A yes. A yes, that someone agrees with a statement. So I'm going to count that as a yes. So X then, in this problem, is the number of people who said yes. And P hat, my sample proportion, my point estimate, is just X over N, it's this number, for about 0.7. Remember, the p hat is similar to the x bar. That's my point estimate from the sample. And if p hat is 0.7, then q hat is 0.3. And now I have, well, I have almost everything I need to know to fill in my equation. The only thing I haven't calculated so far is z sub alpha over 2. <coughs> Do you have that memorized by now? <coughs> 95% confidence interval, what's the critical value? So yeah, 1.96. If you don't have it memorized, it'd be inverse norm what? 0.975. Put it in, plug it, chuck, and that would be our E, our margin of error. 0.023. How do I interpret that number? Uh, there is a, a 2.3% likelihood that the number, that the, that's the margin of error is not correct. <laughs> well, you're, you're off start. to a good start there, then you got off the track. The first thing you did that I like is he changed that to a percent. When we're doing the mathematics, we have to treat the p's as decimals. That's just what the formula requires. But usually when we communicate the result, we multiply by 100 and talk about percents, because human beings just digest that better. So I would say, moving two decimal points to the right, oh, that's 2.3%. That's my margin of error. That's the proportion is 0.023. To find the confidence interval, 0.7, remember, was my point estimate. That's my p hat. So then I subtract the e and I add e to end up with that as my 95% confidence interval. Now, what's the final sentence that I've used to conclude? Summarize my finding. Is that right? Well, you're nine to five percent confident that the mean, or no, the you say proportion? You say proportion. What parameter is studying? The proportion. Yeah. The proportion lies between. That the proportion lies between sixty-seven point seven percent and seventy-two point two percent. Excellent. That's what we just discovered. We are 95% confident that the true proportion of people who believe that global warming is caused by human activity is between 67.7 or 72.3%. Now, if this were a, a political poll, it would probably be said something like this. The current poll shows that 70% of the people agree that human activity causes global warming and this had a margin of error of 2.3%. Same thing. See that? Make sense? Very similar. All right, any questions? Yes? How did you get a, a Q again? 
uh, in a binomial, Q is always 1 minus P. Q is the probability of failure. All right, let me show you another tree. I'm being so good to you today. Go to stat. Make up for all the other abuse in your life, huh? <laughs> We're looking for it's number A on my stat test, and then I see a one prop Z it. Anybody not find that? Go there. All right, just a little bit of background on the TI nomenclature. It does make sense once you think about it. One prop means one proportion. We're studying one proportion. Chapter 9, we're going to study two proportions. And guess what function we use? Two prop. Two prop. Two prop Z. So what distribution is being used? Standard normal Z distribution. And int means I'm calculating an interval. So go ahead and select that. And look what it asks for. An X, an N, and a C level. X is the number of successes. And it must be an integer. So in this case, X was 1501. Or 1050. Never mind. 1050. Thank you. N was 1501. Confidence level is 95. Calculate. Like it better, Cadet Tank? Yes. It's much better. <laughs> As long as you understand what the numbers mean, right? Make sure you know that. Yes. I'm not seeing the last part. I get the, the X and the N also P at, and I'm not seeing what the last one you said after the N. Back here, stat tests. X and C level on calculate. Uh, said X is 1050. X is 1050. I don't see a C level. Okay. Is it for one prop C test? No, C it. It. One prop C it. Use the wrong one prop C test in chapter 8. We're doing intervals. Yes. On a test, can, are we allowed to use this as long as we like, write down all the variables or not? Yeah. You can, you can absolutely use your calculator and the functions. I would never give full credit if you just wrote down exactly what you got out of the calculator. Left paren, 0.67, comma, 0.72, right paren. That would not get you full credit. That's for any confidence interval, I want to see the, the interval. Then what's the next thing you write down? The the inequality. Make sure you know which parameter you're studying, and then write the inequality. Then the last thing you do is the statement. Write your sentence. I am whatever percent confident that this is between. Okay? Now I might ask you, what's the margin of error? If you used your calculator and you got this number out, these numbers out, you would have the confidence interval. How could you find the margin of error? Do you have to go back to the formula? You can subtract P, 0. 0.699, which one is. Well done. You have one of two ways. Remember how we got the interval. It's x bar plus E, x bar minus E, so what is always the width of a confidence interval for a proportion? 2 times E. So you could take the difference from subtract the left point from the right point and divide by 2. Or as Alvin said, I could just subtract the mean from the right point. That's E. Good thinking, all right? Anything else? Because I'm going to put you to work. 
think we're ready to take the training wheels off. 